Hello, welcome back. I'm Professor Steve Miller. Today we'll be talking about the laws of thermodynamics. We'll do a complete re review and look at compressible flow insights from these laws. Then we'll talk about the all-important concept of isentropy, which we'll talk about through the rest of this class. It's a critical idea. Then we'll talk about Reynolds transport theory, which should be, of course, a review for many of you. Once we do this, we'll look at a couple of example pro problems, which I've listed I'll let you work through, and the famous problem done and seen by Ludwig Prandtl. Let's start with a quote. My attention was drawn to various mechanical phenomena. For the explanation for which I discovered that a knowledge of mathematics was essential. Osborne Reynolds. Of course it's true that you've seen the Reynolds number in your previous classes, and you're seeing it again here in these. The idea of the combination of mathematics and fluid dynamics was actually novel. It was not always intertwined like it is today. I like to think about that sometimes. This is a bit of a review class for many of you, but please pay attention to the subtle signs and terminology here and how they fit in with compressible flow. We first look at, if you recall, the first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics is written as an algebraic form in this particular equation of 109. We write delta Q plus delta W equals DE. So notice the deltas in differential nomenclature. Here, delta Q is the heat added to the system, delta W is the work done on the system, and DE is the change in internal energy. This is typically written from state 1 and 2 in the system. In compressible flow and fluid dynamics, of course the first law of thermodynamics holds, but we always and usually apply it locally and not necessarily from state 1 and 2. This is very much like the classes in heat transfer typically taught in mechanical engineering. There's certain processes in fluid dynamics which we must be mindful of. And these are, if you recall, the adiabatic processes. An adiabatic process is one where no heat is added or removed from the system. So an adiabatic process from one to two means that there's no heat transfer. A reversible process means that there's no dissipation and therefore no entropy change, and that we could reverse it. We could go from one to two, state one to two in reverse time from two to one, and there would be no change, we would arrive exactly at the same state. This is going to be very important in this class for certain parts of the flow field, certain regions of the space in which the fluid resides. We call the combination of adiabatic and reversible processes isentropic processes is it's isentropy. There's no losses and there's no heat transfer. It is both adiabatic and reversible. The first law is key. In this class we'll also be looking at the second law to check some of our work and also to make sure that our flows are physical. It's very much possible to find multiple solutions to some of the equations we're finding in this class. Here, of course, we have to make sure that the second law holds. The second law of thermodynamics following Boltzmann in a rigorous definition, is S equals K log W. S is entropy. K is the Boltzmann constant. Log, of course, is a logarithmic term, and W is the number of possible states of the system in the most simplistic way. This theory actually comes out of quantum mechanics. In this class, we're not doing quantum mechanics, and so we'll use this in a slightly different way through the work of traditional thermodynamics. We'll follow that ds, that is the small change in entropy, will always be greater than a small delta q, small amount of heat transfer, divided by the temperature of the system. So t is the static system temperature, and always the small change in entropy must be greater than or equal to zero. So this is more of a differential form. Using this first law and delta Q reversible equals TDS, we might be able to show the following equations in 111 and 112. We can write TDS equals a small change in energy plus a pressure times a small change in volume. Or we might write that the temperature times a small change in entropy, which I hope is positive of course, equals a change in enthalpy, where H is enthalpy minus a volume times a small differential pressure. So this should be complete review for you because you've of course taken thermodynamics. If you don't recall these particular differentials, please review your thermodynamics notes in class. For thermally perfect gases, we can write 
the important equations in 113 and 114 that the change of entropy in the system will go as c sub p of the natural log of the ratios of temperatures from state 1 to 2 minus the gas constant times the natural log of the change in pressures from state 1 to 2. We can also rewrite this in terms of course volumes. You'll see now we have a delta S equals CV of the natural log of T2 over T1 plus R, the gas constant, of the natural log of the change in volumes. Entropy was really pushed forward by Ludwig Edward Boltzmann, and we've already talked about his equations in a previous class. Let's take a minute to appreciate him and his outstanding work in his career. He lived from 1844 to 1906, and he was Austrian. He developed the statistical mechanics, explained and predicted how properties of atoms determine the physical properties of matter. In this particular case, viscosity and thermal conductivity and diffusion are key concepts in fluid dynamics. And at 25 only, he was appointed a full professor of math and physics at the University of Graz, and he chaired the Department of Theoretical Physics. He became the president of the university, and he, of course, was a very hard worker and helped many people. That's how he got to that position. And he was finally elected as a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. He's known today through his major equations, of course, of the Boltzmann equation and entropy, which I just showed, S equals K log W in the previous slide. There's his picture on the right, obviously taken in the mid to late 1800s. Let's now talk about isentropic flows. In isentropic flows, we do not have a particular heat transfer or gain of entropy within the process particularly along streamlines, which we'll analyze. So any flow region where there's no heat transfer and no entropy rise, we might view as isentropic on particular streamlines. Using these thermodynamic relations, we can find the particular changes of state between two particular states in the flow. For example, at position two and position one, where the flow goes from one to two along a particular streamline would be a good example. So we can relate this and say P2 over P1 goes as density two over density one to the gamma power, which is temperature two over temperature one, the static temperatures from one to two, to the gamma over gamma minus one. These are useful properties, but we'll derive more useful ones later in the class. So equation 115 isn't particularly important. Here the subscripts represent states, and the variables are those of the typical variables. Remember, P is pressure, rho is density, T is temperature. Gamma is the ratio of specific heats. For air, it is 1.4. Let's review and look at the summary of thermodynamics, which is important for this class. Not that other parts of thermodynamics are important, but these are the key concepts which will carry us forward. The three laws of thermodynamics plus the so-called zeroth law are that the zeroth law is two systems are in thermal equilibrium with common third system, then the two systems are in thermal equilibrium with each other. That's not much very different than a common theory in mathematics. For example, if A equals B and B equals C, then A must equal C. The first law, of course, is one of the most important and applicable in the class because, of course, that's how we find the energy equation. It's just a form of the first law, and it's the conservation of energy that it can't be created or destroyed. Thermodynamic changes will be in, say, E, internal energy, Q, heat transfer, and W, work in the particular system, which in this case, it's a fluid flow. The second law we just discussed and can be summarized and memorized as the change in entropy with respect to time, that is ds dt, must be greater than or equal to zero. The third law, which is less discussed, is that entropy goes to zero as temperature goes to zero. That is, the disorder in the system and the number of possible states in the system approaches zero as, of course, the limit of temperature goes to zero and entropy must go to zero. That's also quite easy to remember, but probably not the most useful law in thermodynamics and, of course, fluid dynamics, unless you're dealing with very, very cold fluids. The isentropic process, remember, implies that there's no heat transfer and, of course, delta S is zero. So there's no change in entropy, which modifies, of course, the second law. And then, of course, that means the flow might be isentropic. 
it is a condition of isentropic flow. There's one famous joke about thermodynamics, and it goes, what are the three laws of thermodynamics? The answer is, of course, you can't win, you can't break even, and you can't get out of the game. We're going to talk about Reynolds transport theory in a moment. First, let's talk about, of course, one of the famous scientists behind it, Osborne Reynolds. Here's his painting on the right. This painting is painted by none other than John Collier, a very famous British pre-Raphaelite artist. It's worth looking him up on Google. He lived from 1842 to 1912, and he was Irish. He was born in Belfast, Ireland. He studied the conditions in which the flow of fluid and pipes transition from laminar flow to turbulent flow, kinetic energy of gases. At 25, he also became a professor of engineering, just like Boltzmann at the same age, but in a different place, in the College of Manchester. He was the first professor in the United Kingdom to hold the title of professor of engineering, much like in our own colleges here in the United States. He did propose the famous Reynolds average Navier Stokes formulation, and he's of course known for Reynolds number, which came out of his experiments on channel flow. On the right, you'll see in his painting a curious little series of metal spheres in a wooden bowl. This was so important to him that he had it painted. Why might this be? Well, in his lifetime, he was fighting in the scientific community for the theory of atoms versus, say, a background ether or that everything's just a continuum. The idea of an atom was very vexing to people at the time and was dismissed by a large part of the scientific community. By the end of his life, of course, it became very well established and people much in the world accepted the atomic theory. Let's turn our attention to Reynolds transport theory. Now, you should have learned something about Reynolds transport theory in your previous classes in fluid dynamics or aerodynamics or thermodynamics. We'll review it here and look at the important parts of the theory and the nomenclature we're using in this class. We'll certainly use Reynolds transport theory in different parts of the class to formulate our problems and solve compressible flow. We also call this the transport theorem if certain assumptions are not made. In this class, we'll focus though on Reynolds transport theory. And remember, I provided this equation on the class handout, all of the equations for continuity, momentum, and energy, and closed by a gas law. In the middle of the figure, you see a control volume with surface, say, S. On S, there's some point B, and there will be, of course, some differential element on the surface DS. The normal vector will be called N, which is always outward pointing. The coordinate system here is Cartesian with X, Y, and Z in right-handed, and there's a velocity vector that exists everywhere on the surface. It could, of course, be zero to a null vector. Excuse me, a zero vector. And it might have an angle theta between the normal vector and the velocity vector. Now here we'll define some additional nomenclature. We might cat write a capital V, or a V with a solid um, line through it as a volume element. N will be a unit normal vector with a hat on it. At location B, which could be anywhere on the surface. U is a velocity. We can also write U as V, which is more normal in fluid dynamics at location B. Rho is the density once again. S is a closed surface and of course this is a control volume. Remember the trick to solving these entire problems is always to define the control volume carefully. In this way this analysis will be simpler. Let's first look at the continuity equation which is just a remember a fancy way of saying conservation of mass. In words this states that the net rate of mass flow out of a control surface is equal to the time rate of decrease of mass inside the control surface. On the right we show such a control volume which might be deforming. In this case it deforms by say a length b or c depending on where the initial boundary is and the streamlines are going through these boundaries. The boundary moves at some time plus delta t. So the control volume can of course deform. There's angles between, of course, the velocity and the differential elements of area. On the previous slide, we took another figure from another source and wrote it as ds. And of course, we need to somehow apply the conservation of mass, that is the continuity equation in integral form, to this problem. This is what we see in equation 117. Now, it consists of a balanced equation. So the equation's balanced and it goes as the integral of the control surface, 
that is the surface integral of the density times the velocity vector dotted with the differential element a. This will be balanced by a negative partial partial t of the volume integral of the control volume of rho dv. So what do these terms mean? The first term means that the control volume, right, this is an integral over the volume of density, will give us a mass. So this is the time rate of change of mass and the volume. Should be balanced by a rho u dot dA. That's a mass flux out of the volume. So if there's no sources or sinks, that is mass injection or removal in the volume, then the fluxes only should be balanced. For example, in a steady flow with no mass injection, then the right-hand side would be zero because, of course, the mass in the volume is not changing. You can also think of situations where the left-hand side of this equation is also zero. Perhaps the flow is stationary and there's no mass flux, but of course the flow is rotating inside the volume. There could be a mass sink and source, which give us a right-hand side term, which is eventually zero too. Hopefully in your previous classes and this one, you can try out these problems through some examples, which we'll show in some homework problems for compressible flow. In this case, you'll likely need to use the energy equation also, which we'll get to. Now let's look at the integral form of the momentum in terms of Reynolds transport theory. This is based on, of course, Newton's second law and the conservation law of momentum. And we'll write this as 118. The same figure on the right of 161 here applies. In this case, we have Fs plus the integral of the surface integral of B dV, and we'll talk about these in a second of each term individually, is equal to partial partial T of the control volume of rho U dV plus the surface integral of rho U U dot dA. So these second term and first term on the right hand side are very much like the terms in 117, except of course they have an extra U in them. This is very much the same type of thing. This accounts for the momentum flux, right? The chain, the momentum, the, the momentum of the fluid going through the volume, the surface, excuse me, and the change of momentum in the volume. On the right-hand side, we have some sort of type of forces. This is just like your typical force on the right-hand side. This B is a body force per unit volume. So you see it's over a control volume. In this case, that could be something like gravity. It's a body force or electromagnetic forces. And note, I believe that this should be C sub V, not C sub S. I'm sorry for my typo. I'll correct it in the notes. Here, Fs is what we view as a forcing term where rho u and u dot dA is integrated over the surface. This could be an integration of the pressure forces on the surface. You can also take the same equation and apply it to, say, angular momentum in 162. That is, if we take the cross product, of course, with velocity, we'll get angular momentum conservation. There's no point in applying both equations simultaneously because it's the same law, except 120 is just a modification of 118 with, of course, a cross product. Let's now look at the energy equation, which is based on the first law of thermodynamics in the context of Reynolds transport theory. Here in 121 is our mean equation in integral and differential form. dQ dt is, of course, the heat added, the change of heat added to the system. W, once again, is work. We'll put a S there because that could be like shaft work. So that's minus dW dt. And notice the notation here. Some people write a plus and some people write a minus. And I've made a note about this at the bottom, which we'll check in a second. This will be balanced very much like a right-hand side of the other two equations, like 118 for momentum and 117, if this left side was moved to the right, um, for the fluxes and change in energy in the system. So the first one is partial partial T of the control volume of rho E dV. The second term is the interval of the control surface of rho E plus P over rho U dot dA. Here rho is density, E is an energy, 
P is pressure, rho is density, U is the velocity vector dotted with each differential element A. In this case, we'll write E, capital E, as the internal energy plus one half of a mass times u squared plus mass times gravity times some z, which is some potential energy term. One half mu squared is a kinetic energy. So this is the form which actually appears on your equation sheets and you can apply. If there's no heat transfer and no work, you get a very simple term for, of course, the change of energy from sinks and sources in the volume balanced by the energy flux. And you can write this energy integral equation, Reynolds transport theory energy equation, in many different ways. You could write it only in terms of the pressure or temperature or total energy or internal energy. So you'll see many different forms of this. This is generally the form that we'll use in the class. And so check your equation sheet for some uh, form that you might get used to. The last uh, integral equation for Reynolds transport theory, which is not used too often, but it can be, especially for a check if you have multiple solutions to your equations, is the second law of thermodynamics. This will be written as ds minus dq over t is greater than or equal to zero, which we just showed in a few slides ago. The entropy change minus the heat transferred to the system divided by the temperature will be equal or greater to zero. This is the, of course, second law of thermodynamics in words. Let's see how it looks like in an integral form, which hopefully you've derived in your previous classes. It goes partial partial t of the control volume of rho s dv, rho is density, s is entropy, v is volume, plus flux term of rho s u dot dA, so dA is a differential element on the control volume, u is a velocity vector, s is entropy, rho is density, and so this is a surface integral, minus a surface integral of q divided by t with dA. This whole thing is an inequality. It must be greater than or equal to zero. If it's an isentropic flow, of course, you would set this to equal to zero because you can have no heat transfer and you can have no entropy gain. So here, q is a heat flux vector and S is this specific entropy per unit mass. I'll look at some examples where Reynolds transport theory can be easily used, especially in aerospace engineering. This is from a particular NASA engine test. The engine is being moved to a test engine stand. This is from nasa.gov. You can imagine in this particular case, we could put our control volume surface over the exit of the nozzle and in line on the interior of the engine through, of course, the combustion chamber. Then you would have mass fluxes that are fuel injection and air injection in the chamber, and you would have mass ejection and uh, fluxes and energy fluxes and momentum fluxes outside, of course, the nozzle face. You should be able to balance the Reynolds transport theory for mass, momentum, energy, and entropy all in one set of equations and find the major values of the flow. This is part of some of the examples in this class, which we'll be looking at to calculate thrust. Here's a side view of the so-called General Electric GENX next generation engine, which is an advanced dual rotor axial flow high bypass turbofan jet engine, which is in production, of course, at GE Aviation for Boeing 787s and 747-8s in Cincinnati area of Ohio. In this case, what you're seeing is the engine itself on a stand being manufactured, and you have a high bypass duct, in which also goes into a core bypass flow through the core of the engine and out the core exhaust, and you also have the fan exhaust bypass. Of course, this all needs cowling and everything to be integrated on an airframe. But what's interesting in this case is you can also apply Reynolds transport theory to the propulsion problem. You could, you could place your control surface over the faces of the engine. Here's an inlet, here's an outlet, and then here's another outlet. So you have two outlets and one inlet, and you could balance mass momentum, energy, and fine important quantities like, of course, power and thrust of the engine. Certainly, mass should be conserved through the engine. That is the air, the mass entering the face of the engine, plus the fuel, which is injected in the combustion chamber, should be balanced with the total mass flow out of the engine. It's an important concept to apply. We'll try some of these examples in class. Here's a final version. This is a GE electric 
F404 and F112 engines, which are afterburning engines, or we call them augmented engines, in the range of 10,000 to 20,000 pound force classes. These are produced also by GE Aviation in partnerships with Vero L. And L. The same concepts and the same physics applies to every one of these engines, be it a rocket, an aircraft engine that's a high bypass turbofan for a commercial aircraft, or a low bypass engine like this with augmenters for, of course, military aircraft. It looks like this one's bound for an F-18 Hornet. I'll let you take a few minutes and pause these slides to work through the most basic examples, but I want to talk about the application of Reynolds transport theory in practice, and I'll let you try out some of the mathematics. The upper left picture, for example, for a basic thrust calculation, is an outline of a simplified engine where there's a contour of the engine, and in the engine you compress the air, you combust it, and you expand it through a nozzle and exhaust. So there's a velocity in, a velocity out, there's an area of the exit, an area of the inlet, and of course we can place our control volume like this in part B. The dashed line represents the control volume and we have P for pressure, which is of course the internal stress of the fluid. In the lower left we show an axisymmetric view. So for example, AI is the area of the inlet, AE is the area of the exit, and AI minus AE are the differences of the areas. This is where the static internal pressure works on the internal part of the engine, which must be accounted for, of course, in the momentum equation. You can take Reynolds transport theory and quickly write it as the sum of the forces goes as the momentum flux, which will be the thrust, plus the area of the exit times the differences in pressures, and P infinity, of course, is the pressure acting in the ambient, P infinity, time we have an infinity term, will go as, if the engine's operating in steady state, as m dot times the velocity of the exit. That's, of course, mass flux at the exit. I'll let you work out through this problem on your own so you can understand it. I want to talk about one important example where we'll apply it to the so-called boundary layer idea. Remember, boundary layer is the disturbances in chaotic motion of a fluid very close to the wall. If it's a laminar boundary layer, of course it doesn't have chaotic motion, but there's a high amount of shear disturbance in the flow before it returns to the undisturbed mean flow away from the boundary. So let's look at this in the bottom figure here, where I write boundary layer development on a flat plate. This is a laminar boundary layer, not a turbulent one. Here's the flat plate, and flow moves from left to right. There's an incoming flow which is, flow which is uniform at u naught. Zero here is the origin, and the streamwise direction is x, and the cross-stream direction is y. Here you can see in the shaded region is the area of the flow, which of course is disturbed from the mean flow. There's a number of streamlines which come up and are pushed away from the wall by the boundary layer, especially so if it's incompressible, and there's no pressure gradients. You can see at one particular position, L, we can see that there's a velocity profile which only varies with the distance from the wall, which we call y. Out here, there's some static pressure, which we'll just call P sub A for pressure ambient, or P infinity used interchangeably. The actual boundary layer thickness goes as this particular dotted line. In the Reynolds transport theory application of this problem, we'll try and balance this flow through the integral equations by looking at this particular streamline located at y equals h and y equals delta. So the initial flow is parallel to the wall and it has an initial velocity of u naught i and there's a boundary layer thickness that goes as y equals delta. So at 
x equals l, there's y equals delta. And at every particular x position, delta changes. In this case, delta is increasing for this particular boundary layer flow, which is quite normal and expected in a flat plate laminar boundary layer with no pressure gradient. We seek to find the drag force, d, in terms of the flow properties of density rho, inlet velocity u naught, and delta, the boundary layer thickness, at some particular position on the plate L with, of course, span B. That's the distance into the page. Let's try it out. We need to, of course, apply Reynolds transport theory. We need to combine a mass and momentum balance. So this is a particular incompressible flow example, which is rare in this class. We might not need the energy equation. Now, proper selection of control volume is always essential for any Reynolds transport theory problem. So we'll select a particular four-sided region in the control volume from zero to H and from delta L along the volume. Let's check that out in the figure. So we go from zero to H, that's the inlet, and from zero to L, that's one side, and of course from Y equals H, X equals to zero, to X equals L, Y equals delta, and the last outlet of the flow, if you will, will be from x equals l y zero to x equals l y delta. So our control volume we've put, it's our choice where we put it, and careful choices are essential for solving these problems. Where my cursor's moving along the streamline. And this is a steady flow that's laminar. No flow should be crossing the streamline in the radial directions from the streamline. Now we'll try and push and paint that streamline through the flow from x and y of 0 h through x equals l and of course y equals delta. The pressure in these types of flows is known to vary very little in the radial or cross stream direction and since it's a zero pressure gradient, partial p partial x is zero boundary layer in the x direction we shouldn't have to worry about pressure changes in our formulation for momentum equation. This is actually very physical. So we can immediately write, if you assume the flow is incompressible and steady, that there's basically no fluxes through the plate itself because it's a solid surface, and of course the streamline on the upper part of the boundary layer. The only place where flow enters and exits our, our control volume is on the left and right, where the flow starts to go over the plate and where it exits the plate at x equals L. So we can immediately write that the sum of the forces goes as the negative drag, according to our coordinate system, balanced by the fluxes. One and three, for example, indicate the fluxes at the left and right faces, respectively. So I'll go as rho, which we take outside the interval because, of course, it's not varying along the surface, times the surface integral of u with u dot the normal dA plus rho of u, u dot n, dA at the uh, right side. So here, three is this side, and one is this side, and we have to do these two surface integrals. Remember, the distance into the page, the spanwise direction is b, and these distances, of course, are y delta and y h. The problem is, of course, we have uniform flow at the inlet, but now we have a boundary layer flow where u varies on three, so that means this version of u right here is changing. Since the inlet velocity is u naught, we can just simply replace m as a negative one, and u as u naught, and integrate from 0 to h times b to account for the spanwise direction. So this integral is very simple now. The right one we can't simplify much because of course u varies with y and so we can't really remove it from the integral very easily. And then we have to integrate from 0 to delta which is the boundary layer thickness. So we can easily evaluate the first integral and rearrange a bit. And we'll find that the drag goes as the density times u naught squared, which is the inlet velocity, or the ambient velocity of the fluid, times b, which is the span, times h, which is the distance from the plate to the streamline, which intersects uh, the flow downstream, of course. The second integral in 131, we can try and simplify a bit, and we take out rho, because it's an incompressible flow, and b, because the span has not changed, and we're left with an integral, a single integral, from zero to delta of u squared, which is the function only of y dy. Now unfortunately, we do not know h in the boundary layer with respect to the so-called shear layer thickness or boundary layer thickness of delta. 
This is found by applying the mass conservation. So this will help us find it, of course. Since the control volume forms a so-called stream tube, which is bounded by Reynolds transport theory. So now let's apply the conservation of mass in equation 133. Remember the conservation of mass equation, if we scroll back, as the integral of rho u dot dA goes as negative partial partial t of volume integral of rho dV. Now it's incompressible and our control volume isn't changing. And we don't have any sinks or sources of mass in our flow, so we can just cross this out and balance the mass fluxes. Remember that simply, right, that's the mass flow in is equal to the mass flow out. Let's go back to our problem. Here we are. So here's this left-hand side term of the equation I just went to. I'm rewriting this as a integral over the surface over, of course, the z direction and y direction is balanced to zero. There's no right-hand side. We take in rho out because it's incompressible and density is constant everywhere. And we're left with u dot n dA. We can now split this integral up into the mass flux in and mass flux out on the left and right hand side of the control volume respectively. We end up with rho of the integral from 0 to h of negative u naught times b dy plus rho of the integral from 0 to delta of u b dy. So you see we removed the first integral which acts in the spanwise direction just replace it with b of course because it's constant. Simple. If this was a compressible flow, of course, we'd have to leave rho inside these integrals. So in the future parts of this class, don't make that mistake. But I'm just reviewing this problem, which illustrates boundary theory. So I can now simplify this first integral, and I'll just move it to the left-hand side. And I can, of course, as you see, write this as u naught h. There's b on both sides. I cross that out. And the right-hand side will be from 0 to delta of u dy. The wonderful thing now is that I have two equations for continuity of mass and momentum to solve this particular problem. I can now introduce this value of h for a cleaner result in terms of the drag. So I can write drag equals rho times b of the integral from 0 to delta of u times u naught minus u dy. So 135 and 132 have been combined with the conservation of mass to simplify our problem. So you can see that this is a rather famous drag result. 135, this equation near the bottom, is a very, very famous equation derived, of course, by Ludwig Prantl. It goes drag as the density times b, the span, goes as the thickness of the boundary layer times something like the inlet velocity minus u times u dy at the position. So we have a drag function that varies with the position on the plate. Let's try and interpret this equation physically. This equation was first derived by Theodor von Karman in 1921 and was a seminal part of his conference paper on the introduction of boundary layer theory. It relates the friction drag on one side of a flat plate to the integral of the momentum deficit u of u naught minus u across the trailing or cross-section part of the plate. Now, as you imagine, u naught minus u in the equation vanishes as y increases. Therefore, the integral has a finite value. Look at this integral again. As y increases, u approaches u naught, which is the free stream velocity, right? So as our Velocity increases, increases towards u naught as we move away from the wall at any part of the boundary layer. So this must eventually go to zero. This is the so-called famous momentum deficit of u, u naught minus u. This is a perfect example of momentum integral theory for boundary layers. Now let's illustrate the magnitude of this force drag we would want to use a simple approximation for the outlet velocity profile uy, which you might get from measurement, for example. This would simulate a low speed or laminar shear flow, that is a boundary layer flow. Let's say, as one analytical approximation, u goes as u naught times 2y over delta minus y squared over delta squared, defined from 0 to delta for y. So this is how we'll let u vary at, of course, the exit of the boundary layer at x equals l. We can now substitute this equation, u equals u naught times 2y over delta y squared over delta squared, into 
equation 135 to see how it affects drag. Doing that and trying to simplify a little bit by introducing a non-dimensional coordinate to eta, which goes as y over delta, therefore eta varies from 0 to 1, simply for convenience, we will find this particular formula. And it goes as 2 times, excuse me, the drag goes as rho, the density times the span, times the velocity squared, times the boundary layer thickness at x equals l, integral from 0 to 1, as that's for eta, d eta, of this term substituted it in. I'll do the hard work for you and evaluate the integral, but I welcome you to try it for yourself. You'll get 2 over 15, that's 2 fifteenths, times the density, times u squared, times the span, times the boundary layer thickness. What does this mean physically? For laminar flow over a wall that is incompressible, the drag will go as the density, it'll go as the velocity squared, it'll go as the span, and it'll go as the boundary layer thickness. What does this mean? If you want a lower drag, you would prefer to have a lower density fluid. You would want to slow down because the drag goes as the velocity squared for low speed laminar flows. You would want to have a smaller span and you would have a smaller boundary layer thickness. This holds with 1% of accepted measurements and analytical results for laminar boundary layer theory. This is an amazing analytical approximation and a famous and celebrated result. This result had led many other people to use von Karman's integral theory in the analysis of viscous flows, especially with the idea, of course, the boundary layer theory. What's important here is that the velocity squared is the dominant term in the equations. B is the span, that typically is a linear relation with drag. So is, well, delta increases, but delta is always very, very small. We can't really control density of, say, air in the atmosphere of any planet, it's what it is, and 2 fifteenths is a constant. That means the only way to reduce drag is to simply slow down. And you'll see this theme in compressible flow. We'll look at the so-called barrier, the sound barrier, where the drag rises like a barrier as one approaches the speed of sound. And you'll see it certainly is a much bigger factor than u squared, especially when we're dealing with turbulent flows. In this class, we reviewed, and I encourage you to review on your own in depth, the basics of thermodynamics, which are the critical concepts for this class compressible flow. We then defined and looked at the concept of isentropy, and we'll have a whole module on isentropy and isentropic flows and how they can be used to analyze compressible flow results. We reviewed the Reynolds transport theory and applied it to one famous problem on the laminar and compressible boundary layer. But we will be using Reynolds transport theory in the same way, in addition to the energy equation in our homework, in our classes, in our discussions, and I'm sure in your practical work in the future. We also showed a number of examples on screen, which I encourage you to work through, which are in addition to ones from whatever book you chose. Thank you very much for your time. I'm your professor, Steve Miller.